Explore the Outdoors on HBC is brought to you by Cost Cutters of Winona. Hello and welcome to another episode of Explore the Outdoors with HBC. I'm your host, Alyssa Kozak. And today, it's kind of a hot summer day, so I headed down to Preston, Minnesota and checked out Mystery Cave, where inside it is a chilly 48 degrees. Can you believe that? 48 degrees inside, outside temp is in the 80s, 90s with a heat index of 110. So let's head on into the cave and check it out. Mystery Cave was first found by humans, as far as we know, in 1937. That's the first record we have of humans in the cave. Um, if anyone found it before then, they didn't leave any kind of story or record or any artifacts in the cave to let us know that. So as far as we know, the cave was first found by people in 1937 by a gentleman named Joe Petty. The cave itself has been growing here somewhere between half a million and a million years. And that's an estimate based on when the river would have downcut or eroded down through the rocks to be around where the level of Mystery Cave is. Uh, Mystery Cave is primarily a floodwater maze cave, and so the passages, uh, while not entirely being developed by floodwater, are principally developed in that way. The process for developing the cave passages is very similar to getting cavities in your teeth. So flood water has a lot of carbon dioxide in it, and so does groundwater. And that turns your water into an acid called carbonic acid. And that's the same stuff that's in pop, except pop they put in sugar and flavor so it tastes better and coloring and stuff. Uh, but so that carbon dioxide in the water, making it an acid, means that the water can dissolve away a mineral in the rocks around here called calcium carbonate or calcite, which is very similar to the calcium in your teeth which dissolve if you drink a lot of pop and you get cavities. So basically the cave is like an enormous cavity that's formed in the ground. So those features you're seeing on the ceiling here that look like icicles are called stalactites. Stalactites hold on tight to the top. Stalagmites might come up from the bottom. Or stalactite has a C in it for ceiling and stalagmite has a G in it for ground, but then you have to remember how to spell those. So stalactites and stalagmites are types of what we call dripstone, and that is a technical scientific term for them. Dripstone is made by rainwater bringing minerals in from up above us, and when that water comes down into the cave, it's leaving those minerals behind. They become solid and make these new rocks that grow underground. Now, on average, a dripstone grows maybe a tenth of a millimeter in a year. That's about the thickness of your fingernail or of a single sheet of paper. And why is it important to inspire people to learn about what we have to offer in this, in this region? Uh, this is a very uh, unique area in the state. Um, we have no lakes, which is what Minnesota is generally known for. Um, and it's all related to uh, the natural environment that's here. Uh, and in particular to the geology and the history of the area. Um, but generally speaking, getting people connected with the environment is a way hopefully for them to then want to protect it and preserve it and enjoy it. Uh, that's what parks are here for, is for all of us to enjoy and to take care of so that it's also there for our children and our children's children. What makes Mystery Cave different from any other cave? So Mystery Cave is the largest cave that we've found to date in Minnesota. There's a little over 13 miles of passages here. Um, it's by no means the only cave. Uh, there's somewhere around 200 caves estimated in Fillmore County alone and around 400 in this area of the state, uh, which explains why we have no lakes around here. <laughs> the rock is kind of like Swiss cheese. There's holes everywhere. Um, but most of those other caves are a bit smaller than this one. Um, I suppose in terms of people coming to visit, the other main difference with Mystery Cave is it's one of only two caves that are open to the public for tours. Uh, most other caves are off on private land somewhere. What kind of creatures did live here before cave? We have lots of fossils from the uh, Paleozoic era. Um, particularly, we have a lot of um, brachiopods, which are relatives of clams 
and crinoids, which are relatives of sea urchins. So, um, just something to note, if you find a fossil in the park, it does have to stay here. Uh, things that are found in the park belong to everybody who lives in Minnesota as a state park, and so no one person is allowed to take it home. If you find like a raspberry, that's different. You can eat the raspberry. But um, fossils, antlers, those sorts of things are supposed to stay in the park for everyone. Um, if you're really interested in collecting fossils, we know of some places nearby that you can go and do that, where you would be allowed to keep what you find. Uh, but we have a lot of, of sea creature fossils in the cave and in the rocks that are exposed up at the surface in this area. Lots of different features are found in Mystery Cave. Um, some of them quite common. Uh, lots of cave formations, or speleothems, if you want the scientific term for them. Uh, things like stalactites and stalagmites and flowstones, um, draperies, all those sorts of formations. We do have some other things that are a little bit more rare in terms of cave formations. Um, we have a little bit of iron in Mystery Cave and pyrite. Uh, that's not usually found with limestone rock, which is the, the primary reason we have such a large cave system in this area, is all the limestone that's here. Because limestone typically forms when you have a lot of oxygen in your water, and iron forms when there's not a lot of oxygen in the water. So finding iron in a cave can be um, an exciting experience, because that's, that's not very typical. There are formations in Mystery Cave where the cave formations have grown around some of that iron, and then when the iron rusts, it actually expands and it can break those formations. Um, there are a few of those on, on the tour route. Um, going back farther and going caving through Mystery Cave, we've found places where the formations look like they've exploded uh, in places from these iron cord uh, stalactites and draperies and things. So that's kind of fun. There are a lot of fossils in there too, uh, all over. They can be a little hard to see because the lighting in the cave is not as strong as the sunlight up here. Uh, but there are quite a few and usually your guide will point out at least one larger fossil as you're going through the cave. So our first tours in the summer go in at 10 o'clock in the morning. Last tour goes in at 5 o'clock. Um, that's the case up until Labor Day weekend. And then after Labor Day weekend, we have more limited hours. We're mostly just open on the weekends and then for school groups during the week. Um, sometimes, some falls, we've been able to offer some tours during the week, but not regularly. And what all does a tour entail? I saw coming in, there's this big, huge sign that says you can do X, Y, Z tour. Um, <laughs> tell me a little bit about each one of those. So we've got, let's see several different tours. Um, the scenic tour is our most popular one and it's the one that goes most frequently. It's the only one we offer during the week. And that tour route you're going into the historic entrance that was found in 1937. And you go in and do three separate dead-end passages underground, part of that floodwater maze. Uh, there's pavement in there and there's lights in the cave. It's also a very wet end of the cave so there's lots of large cave formations, rather showy, uh, or scenic as the name implies. We also, on the weekends, will do lantern and geology tours, which go through a second entrance into the cave. Um, that end of the cave does not have the pavement or the lights in it, so you carry a lantern. Um, they go over almost the exact same route, but the lantern tour is a little bit shorter, whereas the geology tour is longer because you go into more detail about the science and the geology of what is occurring in this area and what happened before. What would you suggest somebody coming to visit the cave wear? Because uh, it's in my view, we have a heat index of 110 today, <laughs> but in the cave, that's a different story. It is. So Mystery Cave all year round is 48 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, caves all around the world maintain the annual average temperature of the outside air, and so if we took a thermometer and put it outside of Mystery Cave, measured how warm it was every day, all year, add those together, divide by 365 days in the year, you're going to get about 48 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a little depressing to think about. <laughs> but it's always cold in Mystery Cave. So uh, when it's hot up at the surface, um, it's a good idea to make sure you bring along uh, long sleeves in particular. If you're someone who gets cold easily, like I am, I would also recommend long pants um, that you can change into for the cave tour and then change back out of when you're done 
uh, so that you're not overheated when you're up at the surface. Um, scenic tour, if you really want to wear sandals in there, you can, but your feet might get a little cold. Stay tuned for the next segment of Explore the Outdoors with HVC. Perfect. 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 Getting the right look at the right price Perfect. is always in style at Cost Cutters. Located in the professional building in the Winona Mall, 507-454-6030. Businesses of all sizes demand results. That's why HBC provides digital solutions for every business, from startups and entrepreneurs to large corporations. HBC is local. Our team of customer service reps and business specialists are your friends and neighbors. HBC will take the time to understand your business and recommend a tailor-made solution. HBC delivers a competitive edge for a competitive price. Let HBC Business Solutions take your business to the next level. Call 888-474-9995 today. Mom and I take on some of the nastiest places in our neighborhood. If the home has good bones, we'll turn them into amazing spaces. Ready or not. And we're just getting started. Get out of my way, boys. Oh my god. Wow. It's gorgeous. Go ahead, toot your own horn. Toot, toot. All new Good Bones, Tuesday at 9 on HGTV. Fox's new show, The Flare doesn't actually exist, but we still gave it an after show anyway. Does that sound weird? Fox Sundays, real host. You're really famous. He gets it. Real stars. You want me to do this for free? All right, let's try and move on. One unreal after show. Go to commercial, go to commercial. Fred Savage hosts What Just Happened, Sundays on Fox, or watch anytime on demand or on Fox Now. Perfect. 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 Getting the right look at the right price. Perfect. Is always in style at Cost Cutters. Located in the professional building in the Winona Mall, 507 454 6030. Welcome to the second half of this episode. We get to go venture off with eagle hang gliding in Lake City and go up and soar with the eagles over Lake Pepin and over the bluffs and learn what these birds feel like up in the sky. I can no longer wait for this adventure, so let's get to it. I've been flying for 27 years and there was a big group of us, 20, 30 pilots back in the late 80s even the early 80s, late, early, starting as early as the early 70s, and we would come down here and we'd launch off of these cliffs and bluffs surrounding the lake. And when the wind was blowing just right, we were able to step off the cliff and that wind would take us up. We'd fly for hours. Sometimes not only hours, but we'd fly hundreds of miles. And we would land someplace when the wind died off or the thermals ended at the end of the day and somebody would come pick us up. I always wanted to take people up for this type of experience because hang gliding, hang gliding can be traced back to the Middle Ages. As early as the early, early 1500s, Leonardo da Vinci drew a sketch in one of his manuscripts of a man suspended beneath a hang glider. Not much different than today. Oh, what? So many centuries have passed. That was man's dream then and it's still man's dream now to fly like the birds. Hang gliding is the closest absolute way to do that. It's a perfectly designed wing and we are suspended beneath the glider just like Leonardo da Vinci drew and we fly free, free flights. And that's what you get to experience today. To make it safe because it's the launch off a cliff with somebody is very dangerous. If you don't get up, we have to land on a very small beach someplace. And right <laughs> now, there is no small beaches. It's, there's, the river's kind of flowing. Right. So to safely do that, we tow up on, on the boat with floats. And we have this great big landing zone field to land in. 
That's what makes this place so very, very special. It doesn't exist in the other place in the country. There's other places in the country that are like, like reservoirs that have mountains and cliffs and bluffs mm -hmm. surrounding them and they wind to create this type of dynamic air-wise. But aviation isn't allowed in or out. So since Lake Pepin is a natural type of reservoir uh, in classy airspace, we're able to do what we're able to do. The FAA has granted us special permission to take people up for flights if it's for instructional purposes only. So, Alyssa, you get to learn something about yes. hang gliding today. <laughs> How about that? You get I'm to excited. be a student. Yes. <laughs> that hang glider, I actually flew over the Rocky Mountains in. So you're going to be flying in a hang glider that's actually been over the Rocky Mountains. It's pretty cool. That's awesome. What we did is adapt floats to it. Simply put the frame on floats. And we built this platform on the back of the boat, which is hydraulically, it works hydraulically. So after we take off, we fly, and when we land, we land on the floats. And Dane will come over with the boat, and he'll drop that ramp hydraulically. It'll tilt down and kind of like scoop us up and bring us right back to where it's at right now. So we take off the back of the boat, land on the water, and then Dane kind of scoops us up. Okay. On the front of the boat, which you can't see yet, you can see that orange line. That orange line goes into a, it's a big spool of rope, 6,000 feet of line on it. And it's very strong, very thin, very lightweight line. And the winch that tows us up, the mechanism, is similar to like a, casting, bait casting reel. Uh, and when you wind up, a, wind up a bait caster, it has a level re re rewinder that levels the line back and forth as you wind it up, okay? And there's also, you have a drag mechanism on that that you can, you know, drag on a fish. This winch, the thing that gets us up in the air is very similar to that. Mm -hmm. So as we, boat takes off, off across the water, we just lift off the back of the boat and it's under tension. So as Dane drives the boat, we are towed up to altitude. And once we get up to the desired altitude, we'll release from the tow line. The desired altitude could be a thousand feet. If it's a thousand feet and we're by a ridge and the wind's blowing into one of the ridges here that you see across the lake, that wind hits the ridge and it shoots that air vertical. It's called orographic lift. And that's what eagles use. That's why there's such a large habitat of bald eagles because they can nest back in these coolies and valleys and, and ridges around the lake. And when they want to go fishing, they just kind of <laughs> off their nests and they don't have to flap their wings. They can just soar, soar that orographic li lift right above the lake along the ridges and go fishing. What we just saw the eagles doing a little bit ago was different. Those eagles were circling in thermal lift, pockets of hot air going up. And this lake, Lake Pepin, how it moves and turns and winds its way down to Wabashaw from Red Wing, creates up a, a dynamic because it funnels wind into it and funnels wind into these ridges and it's, it makes it for very excellent soaring conditions for soaring birds like uh, turkey vultures, eagles, red-tailed hawks, peregrine falcons, and hang gliders. You know, hang gliding comes in a lot of shapes and forms. You know, for the world record, I do believe doing loops in a hang glider is like 90. I mean, it's crazy. And we're talking about diving a hang glider and looping upside down over and over and over and over and over and over again for like 90 times, right? Oh my gosh. Now that would be an extreme <laughs> roller coaster ride. We're not gonna do that. Okay, good. <laughs> I used to have a flight called the Thriller, and it said, if you love the, the if you if you love the thrill of a great roller coaster ride, this is the flight for you. But I had a caution on it and said it's not for the faint of heart. Okay? Well, I didn't think a whole lot of people were gonna book this type of flight. Everybody booked this flight and I had to take it, I had to take it off because I couldn't do yeah. that all day long, right? <laughs> and so but it the, the hang glider, I can make it like an extreme roller coaster ride, but that's really not what hang gliding is about. Hang gliding is about trying to stay aloft as long as you can without a motor. 
hang gliders are controlled by weight shift. So we're going to be hanging from the center point of gravity on the hang glider, and you're going to be in a harness next to me. So when I want to take the hang glider and I want to go to the right, I just kind of typically shift my body weight to the right. It's like riding a motorcycle okay. or a bicycle. You know how you don't steer it, you just kind of think to the right? The yep. Same thing with a hang glider. Um, if I want to go to the right, I'm just kind of thinking to the right, and the glider's going to go. It's very, it's an inheritively responsive type of sport, meaning that after a while, it, after you learn how to do it, your muscles just kind of take over, like riding a bike. You don't think about riding a bike. Same thing with a hang glider. After a while, you don't really think about flying. It just, that wing is part of you as a person. What is it like flying like with an eagle right next to you? Yeah, well, you might find out today. Um, flying alongside an eagle is like nothing else you've ever experienced. As we got one just flying over us. Uh, it's a turkey vulture, but um, to fly above a bald eagle, you never get to see the top of a bald eagle. So you really get to see how big these birds are and how beautiful they are because you're going to be able to see some from the top. Bald eagles are naturally curious because they really don't have any predators. So when we go up flying and they see our big wing, they're curious. They want to come and find out what's going on. They right. know that we're not a predator. And so they pretty much just let us fly in their same air. We're, we, are, we are guests to their habitat. Uh, many times we'll fly over bald eagle's nest. There's bald eagle's nest right now. Maybe, right now, all the fledglings, all the little baby bald eagles, right now, this week, there's gonna be a bunch of them that are taking their first flights. So they've been sitting on the edge of their nest and up the branches along their nest, kind of airing their wings out. <laughs> they still haven't quite started flying yet, but Yesterday, they were pretty much all of them. There's five different nests that I flew over yesterday. They were all still in a nest. Today might be a different thing. So you might see some eagles fly for the very first time. Oh my gosh. Too. So that's a pretty cool experience. They'll come up sometimes so close to us, you can see their eyeballs. Uh, they're also curious with us, they'll follow us around. So even though we might be flying around, the guys down the boat will radio up and go, hey Dave, you got a bunch of followers. And I'll turn in my harness and look backwards, <laughs> and yeah, there'll be three, four bald eagles following right behind us. Oh you know, my god! If you take a turn, they take it. They take a turn. It's pretty neat. It's really. It's, we haven't quite figured out why there's such an ease with a hang glider, except just for a fact that it's a wing. It's just another wing, just like theirs. Uh, I'm not sure if they're able to perceive the bigness of our wing. Right. because they, they're, they're not intimidated by it at all. Red-tailed hawks, on the other hand, that's a little bit different story. Red-tailed hawks, they, they don't like anybody in their airspace. And they'll let, they'll let us know about it. If we get a little bit too close and they're not happy with it, they'll go pick up a stick and fly by us and throw a stick at us. <laughs> like, get out of here. So that's, that's kind of a unique experience. They're not big stacks, but... Right. Um, that's pretty fun seeing soaring alongside the birds because you really get that flying like a bird experience. The safety of hang gliding. You know, being honest, when hang gliding first started in the late 60s, early 70s, these were guys, kind of hippies that were thrill seekers that were putting together hang gliders based on some article written by popular mechanics. And they were basically using bamboo poles and sheets, plastic sheets, cotton sheets, whatever they could get to try to make a wing similar to what Leonardo da Vinci right. drew. And they'd run off a of little hills and most of the time they were unsuccessful. As technology advanced, they started coming up with better designs and better structures for the hang gliders. At that particular point, people were starting to experiment with getting off, flying off of higher ridges. And, and even mountains, some of those flights didn't end in the best way. But since that 70s and the late, you know, the 70s, late 70s, hang gliding has rapidly advanced, and now technology makes for a very aerodynamic wing that just isn't going to fall out of the sky. It's structurally not going to break apart, 
It's no different than an aircraft. Everything's built with aircraft, aluminum, and type of hardware parts. Sail's not gonna rip. Wings are not gonna fold. If, if I put all the bolts and nuts on properly, they won't. <laughs> but what we usually do... Oh, that's is, not nerve-wracking at all. Yeah, no, no, the duct tape, don't remember. Oh, yeah, yeah okay. duct tape. Uh, <laughs> but we, you know, we check our gliders before we go up and make sure everything's in the right spot. And then you're not gonna fall out of the sky. Actually, hang gliders, if you stall the hang glider, it automatically recovers from that stall. If you dive a hang glider, you cannot keep it in a dive. It'll come out okay, of that, that dive. Guy. That's how they're built. Wow. Stall recovery and dive recovery and roll recovery. So, um, very, very safe. We've never had an incident. Um, I've had thousands and thousands of flights. Um, never, never an incident. Um, last year, I mean, very few accidents happen in hang gliding these days. Any accident that does happen has something to do with pilot air. Okay. And usually it has something to do with the landing, you know. And we're, on this lake, we're landing on floats. So we're not going to run into any trees on landing. Okay, that's a good thing. Yeah. You know, the worst thing that could happen to us is a, you know, a big northern pike jumps up right when we <laughs> land. And we, <laughs> no. Uh, that's that's really about that's really about, about it. Um, talk about how much the weather plays an impact into going hang gliding because yeah. you can't just go hang gliding any given day, can you? No, or? you can, you really can't. Um, there's days, of course, raining and thunderstorms and lightning and all of that. I mean, not a chance. If it gets too windy, uh, let's say the if the if the hang glider is flying at 25 miles an hour and the wind's blowing at 25 miles an hour, you're not really going anywhere. Okay. It's like a kite on a that string. That makes sense, right? yeah. If the wind's blowing at 40 miles an hour, and you're flying at 30 miles an hour, you're actually going backwards across the ground 20 miles an hour. So that's not safe. There's times where, uh, especially tandem, when I take people up tandem, uh -huh. um, that the air is very turbulent, very, unstable and there's a lot of pockets of hot air going up and wherever there's a pocket of hot air going up there's cold air coming down now you experience that when you're in a jet airplane or any other type of airplane right. it's called turbulence right hang glider happens to fly slow enough and can turn sharp enough where you can stay in that bubble that's going up but on the other side of that bubble there's air going down so when that difference of up and down is a little bit too much we don't fly Okay. It can just be not fun, basically. And it can cause a hang glider to tip upside down, which I would recover from, but um, it's just no fun to be in that position. Right. So uh, it all has to do with just knowing those type of environments and when it's just too windy or too unstable of air to fly. I mean, even eagles don't fly when it's, when it's True. unstable. What are your months of operation? We fly from... Memorial Day to about Labor Day. Okay. Uh, and then past that, depending on weather conditions. We're going hang Wow, what an incredible experience. I just had soaring with the eagles, the falcons, the eaglets learning how to fly, and the turkey vultures, and so many more birds. It was an incredible experience, and I don't want you to miss out, so head on over to eaglehanggliding.com and reserve your spot today. Until next time, I'm Melissa Kozak.